Right now on the Daily Debrief, Cuba Gooding Jr. is charged with groping a woman at a bar. Also, attorneys for NFL owner Robert Kraft evade a contempt accusation and... Mass gunmen appear guns blazing. DNA evidence gives the state an edge in a Florida Super Bowl party triple murder. Plus, no child should ever have to go through what he went through. Prosecutors react to a death sentence in the murders of five children by their own father. The Daily Debrief recaps the day in court. It's Friday, June 14. Welcome to the debrief this Friday evening. Attorney Michael Bachner is with me. Good to see you again. It's been a while. Yeah, it has been. All right. Reaction tonight to the death sentence handed down from a South Carolina judge against a man who admitted he killed his five children. Timothy Jones Jr. unsuccessfully tried to convince the jury that he was insane he when he disciplined his son to death, then killed his other kids as they found out. He searched online for legal theories and even for a place he could flee where he would not be extradited back to the United States. The jury re rejected an insanity defense and also rejected a chance to convict Jones of being guilty but mentally ill. Here is the reading of the sentencing recommendation. The entitled case have found beyond a reasonable doubt the existence of the following statutory aggravating circumstances to wit, two or more persons were murdered by the defendant by act or pursuant to one scheme or course of conduct and the murder of five children 11 years of age or younger. Now I'll recommend to the court that the defendant Timothy R. Jones Jr. <clears throat> be sentenced to death. That clerk's voice trembled. The defendant barely flinched as he learned the jury wanted him to die. The defense also barely reacted in that moment. The immediate Jones family, which also, of course, is the family of the victims, broke down in court. Most relatives asked that the defendant's life be spared. And what he did was horrible. He took five of our family members. If you guys <coughs> don't take one more from us, this family can't take it. Now I have to live with this constant fear that I'm going to lose my brother after I've already lost my nephews and nieces. Please, please don't do that to me. Don't make my family have to endure this. I hear what my kids went through and what they endured. <sighs> Sorry. And as a mother, if I could personally rip his face off, I would. That's, that's the mom in me. I don't personally feel like I have the right to put anybody's uh, life in my hands. I don't wish that upon anybody. I don't wish the Jones family to feel what I felt losing my sons. And not long after the jury recommendation, the judge handed down the official sentence. The jury has recommended that the defendant should be sentenced to death. It is therefore the judgment of the law and the sentence of the court that the defendant, Timothy R. Jones Jr., be taken to the South Carolina Department of Corrections henceforth to be kept in close and safe confinement until the 30th day of November 2019, upon which day between the hours of 6 p.m. and 6 a.m., or upon an order of execution issued by the Department of the State Supreme Court of South Carolina, the defendant, Timothy R. Jones, shall suffer death by electrocution or by lethal injection in a matter consistent and as provided for by the law of South Carolina. Signed today by me, Eugene Griffith Jr.'s presiding judge, June 13, 2019. Shortly after that official sentence, the prosecutor discussed the disconnect between the Jones family's wishes and his office's decision to press the death penalty. We've met with them. We've talked with them. Um, we don't harbor any ill feelings towards them. They didn't commit this crime. Tim Jones did. And uh, our focus was on him. And we have respect, try to respect everybody. So there's no ill feelings towards anybody. The people in this community have been uh, carrying this case on their shoulders and their minds and their hearts. Personally, this has been a huge, huge burden for me as well. Just it's been on my mind since the day I became solicitor. We believe these five little babies finally got justice. Um, Mira and Eli and, and uh, Natan, Gabriel and Abigail. We've been waiting so long. They've. They've been on our minds and hearts, and today's the day they got justice. 
you see how real these children were and how special they were, and then how horribly, horribly um, their lives were taken. It's got to affect you, and it certainly affects all of us. With us tonight is attorney Michael Bachner from New York. So, Michael, I want to ask you about this. The family was rather unanimous in saying we don't want the death penalty here, and yet the prosecutor pushed for it, and the jury chose it. Does that make sense to you? You know, there is the disconnect there, and prosecutors are, are supposed to be standing up, you know, for the victims. The victims here are the children, uh, and they are trying to say that although we understand how the parents may have reacted to this and the family may have reacted to it, but our job is to defend the rights of the victims, and the victims in this case deserve the, the, the appropriate punishment for someone who's taken their lives as the death penalty. But that all being said, when you have the surviving individuals of the family saying, please don't do this, please don't do this, you know, juror, the uh, jurors obviously didn't care. Uh, but the prosecutors in weighing their decisions, they, they really should be taking that into massive, massive consideration. And it seemed to me that in this case, the prosecutors kind of shove that to the side, um, they say in a respectful way, but... Uh, yeah, they said no hard feelings, but yeah. uh, I have to wonder here if this does indeed move forward after the appeals court process runs, uh, runs its course, then are there going to be hard feelings? Well, the answer is probably yes, and uh, at the end of the day, you are inflicting substantially more pain on the surviving individuals um, on the case, and you know, uh, my view of the world is that given that type of outcry by the family, I'm not so sure I would have gone forward with the death penalty. Interesting opinions. Michael Bachner will check in again with you in a moment. Former NFL player Kellen Winslow II will be retried on sex crimes charges after a split verdict and a partial hung jury this week. The jury convicted Winslow of three counts, acquitted him of one, and was hung on eight additional counts. The new trial will be held in late September. The jury said it was leaning towards guilt in various degrees, but simply could not reach a unanimous verdict on the majority of the charges. The penalty phase of a California trial involving the murders of a family four is on hold yet again. The jury will return Tuesday after yet another five-day break to continue determining whether Chase Merritt should go to prison or to the execution chamber. The jury convicted Merritt of murdering all four members of the McStay family. Cell phone pings placed Merritt for just a few short minutes near where the bodies were buried in the desert, but he may have been on a neighboring highway. The defense pointed to another possible suspect with a tangled financial history with victim Joseph McStay and to three unknown sources of DNA on items used to bind the victims in their graves. New surveillance footage obtained by TMG, TMZ rather, appears to show actor Cuba Gooding Jr. touching the woman who accuses him of sexual abuse. Gooding pleaded not guilty last night and was released from jail without posting bail. A woman at a New York bar claims the Oscar winner groped her, and their surveillance footage appears to back up her claim, according to TMZ. But Gooding's lawyer says the video reveals that there was absolutely no criminal conduct, in his words. A Florida judge overseeing the case against NFL owner Robert Kraft has decided not to hold defense attorneys in contempt. Prosecutors asked for that punishment after a hearing over whether Florida authorities violated the Constitution when they recorded men receiving sexual massages in a spa. The state accused the defense of threatening an officer who the defense claims said he would make up a reason to pull over a different suspect. Here is how that officer's testimony unfolded. The body cam also um, picks up audio, correct? Yes. Okay. And for whatever reason, I'm asking you, do you recall saying it doesn't matter in response to that? I can make some shit up. You said this, that I said that during the Robert Kraft traffic no. stop? No. Right, this traffic stop right before that. The traffic stop right before that when your audio was on, before you ever knew you were going to stop, Mr. Kraft. Okay. I, I truly, I'm sorry, I don't remember saying that. Okay. And I, I, I don't, I would if I said it, I wouldn't even know the context of how it was said, and obviously, and more of a uh, joke with however you heard that. Okay, so that was said. Okay, so so you, you, whether it was a joke or not, um, you don't have a, a, a. I don't have a recollection of it, so I'm not going to tell you that who I was talking to or whatever. I have zero recollection that I said that. Right, but you're not. You're also not saying under oath. Well, of that course, you're 100% sure. Because you short. probably have something that we're going to come back. Right, wait a minute. The question was, do you recall? His answer is, no, he does not. And then the, the final question is, 
while you may not specifically recall it, what you're not saying under oath is that there's no chance you said that, correct? No, I wouldn't want to do that because you're you may come back. I, I don't remember saying anything like that. If I said something like that, tongue in cheek or in a, uh, in, a, in a goofy manner, which obviously looks terrible now, you know, uh, respectfully, I don't remember saying that. The state said the officer never made the inflammatory remark the way the defense claimed he said it and accused the defense of lying about what the recordings actually said. The judge told the prosecution to file an ethics complaint with the Florida bar if the prosecution wanted to push the issue further. So back one more time is attorney Michael Bachner. Michael, is this a good, Paul, a good call or a bad call, I should say, in a case that's just this heated? Well, uh, the judge the judge is trying to protect what occurs in this courtroom. I, I don't think it rises to the level of contempt, criminal contempt, but uh, asking a witness a question for which you have no good faith basis to believe the answer is what you're suggesting is improper. Uh, and it's something that a judge will generally reprimand an attorney. Now, the officer did say something similar to what Mr. Spiro was alleging, but he didn't say it at all in the way that he did, and he was insinuating that it was. Um, so I think what the judge said is, I'm punting this, bring it up to the bar. Now, Spiro was in there pro hoc vice, which means that he was permitted to be in the courtroom, but he wasn't really admitted in mm -hmm. Florida. Uh, there's a good chance that uh, Mr. Spiro may never again be permitted to practice in the state of Florida. So, um, so there could kind of be that backdoor punishment correct. attached to this. That's correct. Uh, you know, one version of the recording has the officer saying things that uh, really an officer shouldn't say, but it doesn't quite have him saying it the way the defense claimed. And then there's a lot in here. The defense says, well, we didn't get all the discovery from the state. We knew something was there, but we didn't have the exact uh, thing uh, that we needed. I mean, it was a real back and forth on this. Yeah, he's insinuating through the question that he has information that he has no basis to believe exists. Um, a question by a lawyer on cross-examination, you can fish a little bit, but it's got to be, if you're saying isn't a fact you said, you've got to have a basis to say that. So the question was just a little bit too harsh. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, Michael, we'll see you at the end of the broadcast. Still ahead tonight here on The Debrief, a Florida death penalty trial involving three murders. DNA evidence helps prosecutors link together a defendant's alleged movements the night they say he killed three people at a Super Bowl party. The Debrief's analysis is after the break. Florida prosecutors are seeking a death sentence against two defendants accused of showing up to a Super Bowl party with guns and masks and then murdering three people. Christopher Vasada is on trial right now. He is accused of murdering 20-year-old Kelly Doherty, 26-year-old Sean Henry, and 24-year-old Brandy Al-Salhi. Police found Vasada collapsed on the road about a mile away from the shooting scene near his own car. They say he was carrying a glove, a magazine, and a bullet. We were unfortunately not able to bring you the opening statements in this case earlier this week, so let's um, listen now, rather, to some of the prosecution's opening remarks. Christopher Masada says he was at a friend's house and he got shot. But the evidence will show you that Christopher Masada was at the house, but he was not at the house as a guest of Charlie Warby. You see, Christopher Masada came there with Marcus Stewart. And in the course of firing multiple rounds into Kelly Doherty, Sean Henry, Brandy El Sahib, he too was accidentally shot. And you see, although they may have walked to Mohawk or ran or a light job, after he was shot, he couldn't run. You will hear that Sean Henry's car that was once in the driveway of Charlie's house was no longer there. And in fact, that vehicle that almost hit the deputies was being driven by Marcus Stewart. You're going to hear that vehicle was followed back to a black car that we saw in the surveillance video, the car belonging to Christopher Vassar. Prosecution continued by explaining what the police found when they searched the defendant's car. The car was near where they found the defendant laying in the street about a mile from the shooting scene. And although that car was photographed on that night, law enforcement didn't initially know that that car was relevant. But when they found out, a search warrant was executed on that car. Christopher Vasada's cell phone was found in that car. 
multiple bullets that were found in that car. A rifle bag was found in that car. And when Christopher Basada was found laying in the street, he had bullets and magazine in his pocket. You're going to hear over the course of the investigation there was a pharmacy. I-95, Palm Beach Gardens. It's learned that there is a vehicle who we later learned belonged to Sean Henry was found on the shoulder of the road. <coughs> that was the vehicle that was taken because Christopher Posada couldn't run from the scene. He was shot. Law enforcement responded to the shoulder of the road. Inside of that vehicle, there is a pillow in the back seat that is stained with blood. A pathologist who examined the victim's bodies faced this cross-examination about some confusion about the number of bullets fired. During the deposition, when you were asked that, you answered that at least 12 that are separate wounds that we know definitely came from separate bullets, right? Yes, that's what's my answer. Okay. Different than today? Pardon? Different than today? I don't think the questions are the same. Okay. And I understand that in this case, you're having a difficult time because of the number of gunshot wounds determining uh, what's an entrance, what's an exit, if this is connected to that one or, or whatever, right? You were shot multiple times. I understand, ma'am. I understand. Uh, well, you no. know, I'm going to probably count sometimes the exit wounds as an entrance. Okay. You know, I may have given different numbers. I may have counted some exit for entrance. But I don't see the point uh, of the question. Would you please uh, tell me well, if that's a mistake you pick up from this report? I don't know if it's a mistake or not, ma'am. I was just asking the question. Well, he was shot multiple times. He was okay. shot twice in the head. They are fatal wounds. He was shot multiple times in the body, and several of those wounds are fatal. Yes, ma'am. We understand. That's we the crime. That. So, <laughs> and just so I'm clear, yeah. your counting today was 17 separate shots, correct? I counted 17. Okay. Yeah, but maybe if you give me the time, I'll count another number. Okay. And at the time of the deposition, under oath, ma'am? Yes. I went to the same thing and went through wounds, you know. I, <clears throat> I, I don't think that's the, right, what's just pause, really just important. Doc, doc, just pause there. Wait for the next question, please. Okay. And, ma'am, at the deposition, your answer when asked was 12 times. Is that correct? Uh, that's, sir. Uh, that was the answer you asked me, and I said 12 that were definitely, let me see how I answered that. An associate medical examiner testified about the cause of death of one of the victims. So the cause of Kelly's death was multiple gunshot wounds, and the manner is homicide. Did you see any defensive wounds on Kelly, like where she, you know, had injuries to her fingernails, where she's fighting someone off or anything? The only blunt force injuries that she had were the abrasions that we saw on her ear and neck. Okay. And um, her toxicology, did she have some drugs in her system? She did. What did she have in her system? So Kelly has marijuana, marijuana metabolites. She has a, an alcohol level of 0.15. Mm -hmm. And she has amphetamine in her blood. Could amphetamines be like something like ADHD medicine? Amphetamine, there's no methamphetamine, so the amphetamine can be a prescribed drug. There's no way for me to tell okay. whether the amphetamine that's in her blood is from a prescription or from an illicit source. Amphetamines um, could be legally like Ritalin or Vyvanse or something like that. Correct. Okay, go ahead. Um, and she also has cocaine. Did Kelly die from anything related to the drugs? <clears throat> Drug over overdose case? Not in my opinion. Prosecutors believe defendant Christopher Vasada ditched his BMW far from the scene and then walked to the party to commit the shooting. They theorize that he was accidentally shot during the attack, which is why they think he and his co-defendant, Marcus Stewart, stole a car at the shooting scene and then took off towards Vasada's car to pick up Vasada's car. Analysts found gloves in the stolen car with DNA from both defendants. They also found Vazada's blood in the stolen car. And they have Vazada's DNA on a hoodie recovered from a culvert near where the stolen car was ditched. A defense 
Questioning pushed back at a DNA analyst's interpretation of the scene, however. Now, 19B, the steering wheel of the Honda, you find that it is, the majority of it is Sean Henry's, right? Yes. Okay. And that Christopher Rosada, you conclude, is 10% of the mixture on that. Right. So he most is closely associated to contributor to, which is about 10%. Okay. Were you aware that there was a video of this vehicle and a video that showed that Mr. Vasada is in the back seat and is not driving the vehicle? Um, no, I haven't seen. I was unaware of the video. Okay. And the detectives didn't share that with you? Mm, it may have been in the case scenario, but I don't recall at this time. Okay. And so if Mr. Vasada mm. does not touch the steering wheel of that vehicle, how would his DNA get there? I don't know how DNA would get for on any of these profiles. I can't testify to that. I can just testify to the results. So I'm not sure how it got there. Well, you've already testified about transfer evidence, right? That could be one explanation, yes. Okay. So if Mr. Visada never touches that item and his DNA is on it, then one of the better scenarios for this is transfer. Right. So that could be an explanation, yes. Returning now is attorney Michael Bachner from New York. So, Michael, look, I mean, he was in the car, all right? They've got footage of him in the car. Maybe he reached over and touched the steering wheel. Why, why quibble over all of those points in there? Well, there's DNA is found in certain locations, uh, and she's trying to establish that there could have been transference and that, uh, in fact, they're trying to demonstrate that the DNA evidence found is really not corroborative of their theory that he was that he was a shooter in the case. Okay, so it, it seems to me, though, still, despite all that, this, this is a strong case for the state. They had a hot pursuit. They've got, uh, they caught up with this guy. They had bullets. They had gloves. They, uh, you know, how did they wind up in this vehicle when his vehicle was a mile away? Yeah, they just need a ribbon on top. I mean, they're, they're, <laughs> they're, there's, a, there's pretty strong evidence in this case, uh, uh, as well as a, a, what they're claiming to be a confession, which is later recanted. Um, so uh, it's, it, Defense has to raise the issues that they can raise and try and uh, to uh, try and demonstrate that this is just not what the prosecution is saying it is. But yeah, I agree with you. This is it's pretty strong. All right, Michael, we appreciate your opinions here on the debrief. As always, we're so glad that you joined us as well. Our live trial coverage resumes Monday at nine o'clock in the morning. That's Eastern time, and I'll be back on the debrief Monday at five o'clock Eastern. Have a good weekend, folks.